The, t the title of this chapter is Steroids and Sepsis, but it's actually more than that. So we'll go through sort of the latest and greatest update on what we're supposed to be doing about sepsis. It's actually kind of interesting stuff. Um, we've gotten pretty good at recognizing sepsis in the whole sort of spectrum of systemic inflammatory response to sepsis to true septic shock and kind of the spectrum. We're getting kind of sophisticated at that. What's kind of interesting is that there's now a kind of major focus on front-end loading treating people with sepsis. Because what turns out happens is if you do it right up front, people survive significantly better. And it puts the kind of ball game into our territory. It puts a lot of this front loaded in the emergency department. Now, when we get to the end of this, I'll tell you where the areas of controversy are, and there still are quite a few. And a lot of this, a lot of the areas of controversy have to do with what really needs to get front loaded in the ED, what can wait till it gets to an ICU, and what do we even have even a couple of days to fiddle with in here? And, the, and right now it's not exactly clear some of this stuff, but we'll get into the details as we go through it. So the major changes that have happened in dealing with sepsis are sort of fall into a couple categories. One is the, the use of steroids, and I'm going to take you on a little journey, a little history journey on sort of where we came from, where we are now, and where the controversies lie. The, um, what's called early aggressive or early goal-directed therapy for sepsis. We'll talk about things like um, empiric antibiotics and activated protein C. I'm going to mention briefly glucose control and a couple of other things, but I'm going to refer you to a paper that probably a lot of you know about. That's the sepsis campaign paper that's out there. I'll give you the reference at the end. But it'll talk as well about sort of other options like vent settings, et cetera. So that's the general gist. Let's get into the steroid idea. Those of us who have been practicing long enough to have a few gray hairs around the temples, remember steroids initially weren't around for sepsis. Then they were around for sepsis. Then they completely fell off the map for sepsis, and they're back. They're back different, though, than they were initially. And so let me take you on a journey of where this came from. Steroids have been around and used to treat sepsis since the 1960s. It's been actually out there for a while. And there was a decade of pretty intense research on looking at the use of steroids and sepsis that happened in sort of the 80s and 90s, um, sort of late 80s, early 90s. A couple of representative abstracts are in there that go back to the early 80s. One is abstract number one by Parker, which was one of the studies that sort of started the idea of why steroids might be useful. Well, this is a really tiny study. It's only 20 patients. But they found that sepsis does all kinds. This is one of the first studies that looked at sort of the systemic and you know, inflammatory response to being septic, was it looked at hemodynamic function in people who were septic and found that hemodynamic function, even in people who have normal hearts, just being septic caused hemodynamic dysfunction in people, which led to one of the sort of first eyebrow raising of, wow, you know, sepsis isn't just an infection in my blood or a pneumonia that's gotten into my blood. It causes all of my organs to do bad things. It was one of the first studies that, said, that sort of looked at myocardial depression. Abstract number two um, found that using some steroids in those groups, in that group that got septic with hemodynamically, hemodynamic dysfunction, it increased the measurements. But the outcomes were the same if you use steroids in that group. Aspect number three is actually a prospective controlled study. What this one did is it's, these are all small studies, but it compared three groups, each of about 20 patients, 21, 22 patients, around there. And what they did is they used steroids, but they used, one group was a placebo group entirely. One group got dexamethasone, just one or two doses, and one group got methylprednisolone. Now, the dose that they used in these studies early on was 30 milligrams per kilogram of, de of methylprednisolone, humongous doses. We're talking huge doses of steroids. And in fact, this is the era where a lot of the research done with steroids, for whatever reason, asthma, et cetera, used these enormous doses of steroids, these mega huge doses. What they found in that particular small study, those three groups, two doses of decadron versus high doses of methylprednisolone versus placebo, was that oh, there, was, there were no differences in the big stuff in those three groups. The overall likelihood of getting your shock better, same. The overall, the hospital mortality, same. They did find that people had an earlier stabilization if they got steroids, but ultimately it didn't change their outcome. So that's sort of, okay, well, hmm, maybe there's something we can kind of tweak to make that a little bit better. And a few more studies were, were done sort of following this. Abstract number four was one of two big groups that started looking at specific areas that steroids might help. This was looking at ARDS. This was the methylprednisolone severe sepsis study group. It was a big multi sort of center trial. And they wanted to see, do steroids help ARDS 
in people who have sepsis. We know they go into ARDS. It's one of those organ systems that gets creamed when you have sepsis. And what they found actually, again, mega doses of steroids, Q6 hours, you know, total of 30 per kilo, big deal. They died more. They were more likely to get ARDS, and they were more likely to die if they got, got steroids. So that didn't fly. Asterisk number five was another of these big groups that looked at this. This is actually another huge 30 milligram per kilogram dose. They compared outcomes to controls in about 110 people. They found overall that the mortality was the same in both groups, that these huge doses of steroids didn't improve outcome. And overall, this just over, you know, several studies in, in order looked at these. Abstract six is another one. Abstracts seven and eight were the death knells. What happened is basically in the mid-1990s, two authors, one did a review, one did a meta-analysis, looked at all of the data of that preceding decade of research looking at steroids and sepsis. Abstract number seven is by Leffering. This is a review of 10 prospective randomized controlled trials. Okay, these are good kind of set up kind of trials and found that there was no statistically significant benefit in mortality to get these big doses of steroids. Just to add the final you know, sort of death blow to this thing, Cronin in abstract number eight did a meta-analysis of nine papers and basically showed not only is it, did you not get better, you were worse. You had an increased risk of mortality with high dose steroids. And that was the end of it. Okay, that basically was the end of it. Steroids, I was actually finishing residency around that time, and we were using steroids. At my, I was an internist in my first life and an emergency doc in my second. I did a full internal medicine residency, and then went back and did a full emergency medicine residency. And it was about this time that we were giving humongous doses of steroids, and then it evaporated. We just, it, it was like overnight, when these two papers came out, we stopped. That was it. So why am I talking about steroids and sepsis? Because they're back. Abstract number nine sort of started this resurgence into thinking about the concept of steroids and sepsis. It's one of several that came out about the same time. What they found in this one is that it is a study by Merrick. They took 59 patients in septic shock. So these are people that had bugs in their bloodstream, had low blood pressure from sepsis. And he found that there was a relative adrenal insufficiency in these patients. Sort of like the first set of research started because, well, there's this hemodynamic insufficiency weird thing that happens in sepsis. This one, they actually measured things like cortisol levels and said, you know, these people's cortisol levels are either low or they don't respond to being stimulated in sepsis. Is that the issue here? Is that the problem here, that their adrenals are being squeezed? They found that 61% of the patients in that particular smallish study had adrenal insufficiency, kind of a lot of people. That led to some people raising an eyebrow and saying, wait a second, maybe it's the dose that was the issue, not the steroid concept itself. Maybe that was the problem. So abstract number 10, did a meta-analysis, and what they did in this particular abstract is they went back and looked at some of the studies. They took five randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials using physiologic doses of steroids, so 300 a day of hydrocortisone equivalent, more or less, and compared it to nine studies that looked at those mega doses of steroids, those humongous doses, and tried to see, you know, was, it, was there a difference in those two groups? The mean total steroid dose, it's eye popping, in the physiologic studies, the total dose the patient got of steroids was about 1.2 grams. In the high dose studies, the total dose of steroids they got was 24 grams, uh, basically over the same sort of general time period. What they found when they split those two groups apart is that the physiologic dose people had a measurable increased likelihood of survival. The positive likelihood ratio was 1.23. So they're basically about 0.25% more likely to survive than somebody who didn't. And, and they found if you got those mega doses, you were more likely to die. So they found, hmm, high dose, not good. But a little bit of physiologic dosing looks pretty good. The benefits in that study were independent of whether the patient had a cortis and stim test that was positive or not. It was independent of what your body did when you stimulated your, you know, gave ACTH. It was independent whether your body could respond. That was independent. Abstract number 11 did the same thing. They, what they did in this is analyzed a bunch of studies as well and found the same deal. Physiologic dose patients were more likely to survive than were people given super mega doses. Looked pretty good. The bottom line to all of this is what the, there's a, uh, the paper by Dellinger. It's the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. It's kind of outlined at the end of this particular article. Their quote as far as what to do with steroids is that physiologic doses of steroids are indicated for seven days, given in three to four divided doses daily, in patients with septic shock who remain hypotensive and need pressors. 
Okay. It turns out it's the presser dependent group and that their paper by uh, Minichi, or it's abstract number 10, found that the group that had the best response were those that were st stayed hypotensive despite being resuscitated and needed to be put on pressors. If you want to get sort of a clean approach to this to take home to use today when you go to your shift or tomorrow, what you want to do is if you have somebody who's sick as a dog, you resuscitate them like crazy, they still stay hypotensive, so you're not a start a presser. In your head, that should get linked to a steroid. Okay, so those, now, and the reason is, we don't know for sure that everybody who is septic, who doesn't need pressors, needs the drug. And there is maybe some potential downside. Um, Action number 12 is a paper that came out just a little bit over, late, late uh, 2005 that looked at vasopressor dependent septic patients. Okay, the group we're worried about, 500 of them, 522 patients. And what they said is, okay, if people are that sick, they should have low cortisol levels, and then this should make the patients better. What they found was that people who, with their sepsis, had low cortisol levels did better than patients who had, who had higher cortisol levels and got steroids. Now, that is, to me, that's counterintuitive. I'm thinking, okay, wait, if they're so sick that their adrenals are squeezed and their cortisol is low, they should be the ones that respond well to getting steroids, and they should get better. Actually, what probably happens is these in that range of septic shock are the less critically ill, therefore their, their cortisol levels are lower versus the, or, or, than the higher cortisol levels of the people that are sicker. Overall, that didn't make sense, it's backwards. Overall, the bottom line, Rady's study, th there's a couple problems with this study just to know. They had a lower mortality rate in this study than any other study published on vasopressor, vasopressor dependent sepsis. Their death rate in this study was about 25%. If you are a presser-dependent septic patient, you need pressors to keep your blood pressure up, most studies show a 45 to 50% mortality rate. So theirs was half of that. What's the reason that was half of that? Something's funny here. Even though it's a large study, why would they have only half the death rate? The other thing is not everybody in this st study got steroids. Not everybody actually got the steroids. This study is a bit of an outlier, and I think the bottom line truly is we're not exactly sure tweaking it, who's the perfect patient to get steroids, who's septic. It does look like presser-dependent patients who are septic should get them. Don't broaden that to anybody who appears to be septic but is otherwise doing okay. You know, you're septic and they look fine. Don't broaden it because we're not sure that, that there's benefit there. And we're going to keep an ear to the ground to see if we could tweak this a little better. The other thing that most um, intensivists want you to do, which I think is not unreasonable, is to get a, just a random cortisol level before you give the steroids. So they have some idea, because of studies like this, whether the patient is low cortisol to start or not. You're going to screw it up once you give your hydrocortisone. So the bottom line truly is pressor dependent, give them. Not pressor dependent, hang, don't. And if you give them, get a cortisol level before you give it. Make sense? That's been a pretty big change. Um, steroids were totally out of the picture. For those of us that had dropped it from our few little bet cell synapses, we have to go back and resynapse that just with a little different dose. Okay. All right, how about activated protein C? How many of you guys give it in your emergency department? Oh, excellent, excellent, excellent. The, the whole, besides the fact this stuff costs a fortune, the activated protein C is a really interesting agent. It's basically human, human activated protein C. It is anti-inflammatory, it is pro-fibrinolytic, and it is anti-thrombotic. One of the reasons people with sepsis die is they get micro embolisms everywhere, little teeny micro -throm thrombi everywhere, and they necrose bits, and they basically knock off end organs. That's why one of the reasons you go into ARDS. The theory is you give this drug that breaks up clots a little bit, doesn't make you clot itself, it's, a, it's protein C, it's activated protein C, and it's anti-inflammatory, yoo-hoo! Maybe we can take all those little end organ things and make them not happen so that people will get better. That's the theory behind this. Abstract number 13 is one of several that came out that are, are drug company sponsored studies. Eli Lilly, I believe, is who makes this. What they did is looked at septic patients, 1,690, a lot of them, that had severe sepsis of less than 24 hours in duration. However, this study, like the others in the cat, this category of studies, looked at septic people who were otherwise healthy. So all of you in this room suddenly got bacteremic with E. coli and you crashed and burned and you got septic. You otherwise have good heart, good lungs, good everything else, your guts are fine, everything else is fine, you're not a raging diabetic, you're not in congestive heart failure. Think about the septic patients we see for real. 
They're often the nursing home patient who comes in who already has a million medical problems, or the diabetic who's already lost a leg and has heart disease. A lot of the septic patients we see will not fall into the category that was studied in all the studies of activated protein C. So that's kind of point number one that's really important. Point number two that's really important in activated protein C is all of the patients who got it were not just sick, they had Apache scores off scale. I mean, they were no comorbidities and they were really sick septic patients, which is kind of fine. If you have a 25 year old who gets you know, terribly septic from pylo because they have a stone and they obstructed and they just crash and burn because they have E. coli sepsis, this is the kind, otherwise they're totally healthy, they're presser dependent, you've got it intubated, they're sick as a dog, that's the kind of person who will do well with this drug, who will get the benefit the drug is supposed to do. Otherwise, though, it's a bit of a problem. What they did find is that the mortality rate was a, an absolute improvement of about 6%. Now, I want to go back and point one thing out in this particular study. The mortality rate of the patients overall was about 28% total in the study. Everybody combined together, but remember, if you have a high Apache score, you're presser dependent, intubated, et cetera, and you're septic, your mortality rate is 50%. So by filtering out the no core morbidity people, they selected a group of patients that will tend to do better anyway. That being said, they did get a 6% absolute improvement in people's survival by giving activated protein C. It's a gazillion dollar drug. It's $2,500 off shelf, not counting anything else that gets added to it to give it, monitor it, et cetera. It's a 96 hour infusion to give it. It's very, very expensive. And, it is, and if you think about it, what it's doing is profibrinolytic and antithrombotic. So it does increase the risk of bleeding. In that patient population that was otherwise pretty healthy, the bleeding risk was 3.5% in those that got, and this is serious bleeding, meaning transfusions or something intervention had to happen. 3.5% in the group that got the drug and 2% in the group that didn't. So basically, it almost doubled the risk of serious bleeding. Their feeling on this, though, is in that very selected patient population, it is an indicated drug because the risk-benefit ratio is such that it's worthwhile. Do not extend that out to the critically ill, multiply comorbid, incredibly sick person. It isn't necessarily as helpful in that group. So the bottom line on activated protein C, I'll tell you the other good thing about activated protein C. It turns out that there is not a magic like TPA window equivalent for activated protein C. It looks like you can give this as far as 24 hours after presentation and still get the same benefit. So the onus of give it isn't really on us. It's on the intensivist that will take care of the patient once you call and, and make that admission sort of transfer. So there's so this you know, push to activated protein C, not so much. Steroids probably, if they work early on, is better. This one doesn't seem to make a difference in that first, when in that window of 24 hours, you start it. So that's kind of nice. That's excellent. So overall, that's the deal with activated protein C. The next section looks at early goal-directed therapy. This is a huge push. And this is our responsibility in the emergency department. This really does fall into our purview of what we do. What this is is basically the goal of early, what it's called early goal-directed therapy is intensive monitoring from the get-go. So the minute you recognize a patient is septic, you start all this stuff. They recommend things like CVP monitoring, which we don't do in our ER. There's just no capability. But at least getting into an ICU as soon as possible where they can get it. They recommend aggressive fluid hydration. Okay, if they do not respond to fluid hydration, aggressive and early pressors, okay, to get their end organs perfused. What is the magic number for hydration? There is no magic number. You know, in kids, if they come in septic, it's 20 per kilo and then another 20 per kilo and then maybe another 20 per kilo and then pressors. Because kids are basically healthy otherwise, that's reasonable. But if you were to do that to somebody with an ejection fraction of 10%, you'd throw them into pulmonary edema. So you have to make a clinical decision on a case-by-case -case basis of how much fluid is appropriate. So if, if, if you have a young, healthy person, have at it. If you have an older person with bad heart disease, don't. And that, so that transition from aggressive fluid management to pressors is a case-by-case -case basis. But make that transition. I recognize they're septic, I get them monitored early, I give early antibiotics that I think are appropriate to whatever their source might be, I fluid resuscitate, clinically appropriate to the individual, and I get them on pressors. And then the last bit of early goal-directed therapy is to get them to an ICU bed. 
We already discussed the problems with that earlier today. That isn't necessarily as easy to do as giving some fluids it, um, is to do. And by the way, all of this is absolutely manageable in the emergency department with the exception of in, in invasive monitoring and getting them out. Everything else you can do in the emergency department. And it's em emphasized strongly to start this up front. There's a, there's a little bit of data that says we don't. Your goal is to get them as stabilized as possible within four to six hours, to really get them at least their blood pressure stable, get them kind of stabilized within four to six hours. It says overall here we don't do that as well as we should. And I think part of it is just transitioning into this concept of just sepsis is like an MI. You know, you just get in there and you just aggressively get them as stable as possible as early as you can. So that's kind of the goal of that. Um, the bottom line, the whole end section here, it's called the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. It was published by Dellinger in Intensive Care Medicine in 2004. This was a group of people that got together, intensivists primarily, that got together and said, what's the literature and what are we going to recommend as a stepwise approach to maximizing the survival of people who come to the hospital septic? It is actually a well worth reading and well worth printing out article. It's really worth having. It's a lovely sort of overview of what we should be doing and why. It has pretty good data to sort of support it. Initial resuscitation we talked about. Your goal, by the way, if you want to sort of, how do I know if I'm getting where I want to be? Your goal is to have a mean arterial pressure greater than 65. Okay, you don't want them sitting, hovering at 50. You'd like to get their mean arterial pressure up. And that's, and that's not super huge, okay? That's not a fabulous mean arterial pressure, but you at least want to get them up to something that would perfuse the major end organs that are important. You want a urine output of at least a half milliliter per kilogram per hour. So you'd like to have a urine output of 30 to 40 cc's an hour. Think about all the people you put a foley in and then you still stand there for a while waiting. It's like, do you see anything? I don't see anything. Is anything coming out yet? You go back to the bedside an hour later, anything in there? No? Well, you want something in there. So you want to get those kidneys perfused so that they actually pee. That's a really good end organ to measure that you're not get, not get what you need. Ultimately, if you want to measure CVPs, you can. If you want to measure central venous gases, you can. But overall, for us, practically speaking, I want a MAP greater than 65, and I want a urine output half a, half a cc per kilo per hour. That's what I want. Those are my goals. You want to do appropriate cultures as sort of step number two. So you want to you know, do all the jazz we always do. We are, now that we're all getting monitored for getting our blood cultures in pneumonia patients, we've all gotten really on board with getting cultures. The thing about cultures to know, though, is if someone has an indwelling line, get at least one culture from that indwelling line. Okay, so somebody comes over the pick line. A lot of people now are going home with pick lines. Somebody comes over the pick line who's septic. Draw one blood culture through that. You can draw the rest peripherally. Use your antibiotics empirically and aggressively and early. So you know the odds are, if someone comes in septic, especially if they're older, what are the two biggest sources? Lungs and urine. Okay? The other things to look for are skin. Roll them over. Look for that big hunk into cube. Skin is a big one, and so is the gallbladder. So if you have a septic older person with a completely normal chest x-ray and a completely clean urine, it's here. Okay, if you look at their skin and there's nothing in their skin, it's in here. So cover the gut. Okay, so as far as empiric choices of antibiotics, most of the time you're going to be covering urine and lung because that's really the vast majority. But if you, they're still septic and you don't know where the source is, cover gut. Okay, but, and start it early, aggressive antibiotic therapy. Source control, clean out any messes. If they've got gooby, horrible you know, skin things, clean them up, get the source control taken care of. And then fluid therapy we talked about. Pressors, as soon as you decided fluids aren't working, get them started. Which presser you decide is up to you. Most people are recommending starting with something like a Neodrip or a Levodrip to start, not dopamine. Back in those of us that trained back in the old days, dopamine, it was like this, everybody just grabbed it as the first line drug. It's pretty hard on your heart to use dopamine. If someone has known poor squeeze, though, and they need the extra squeeze as well to keep up their blood pressure, consider something like dobutamine. You may want to add that as your second agent if something like Neo or Levo doesn't work. So Neo and Levo for sepsis patients to, to get that systemic vascular resistance clamp back down again. And then if they're still hypotensive, you need to add another agent. If they have a history of heart dysfunction, failure in particular, consider dibutamine. If not, you're, you know, it's totally up to you what you add as a second drug. Steroids, yes. Okay, remember, presser dependent only. Go ahead and give them. Activated protein C, honestly, we're pretty much off the hook. Just convey to your consultant that you have a presser-dependent, sick-as-a-dog, septic patient you're admitting, 
Your intensivist should know the deal on what to do with those as far as activated protein C. Um, there are some specifics if you want them in that article as far as who absolutely should never get it, even if they're pressed or dependent because the risk of bleed, I'll let you kind of read that on your own. The rest of the article, and it's worth polling, deals with things like um, if you have to intubate somebody who's septic, what do you do? I'll tell you the bottom line to that is the big push these days, and it really is saving lives, is low volumes. You want to, if you intubate a septic patient, you want low volume, six per kilo, seven per kilo, not the 10 to 15 per kilo. Most of us grab 10 out of the air. You know, 10 per kilo, uh, 700 for your usual 70 kilo person. Doesn't work. What works better in a septic patient is to start more at the six per kilo range. It's kind of like the permissive hypercapnia in, in asthma, same idea. These people do much better with low volume, so they don't get ARDS anywhere near as frequently. So that's the other kind of twist to our usual stuff with sepsis, is to just lower your tidal volume settings on these folks. The other thing is to crank down on the oxygen as soon as you can. For those of us that work in ERs, where you intubate them and then you're seeing the next 60,000 patients and they're in the ER for a while, go back. If their SATs are good, crank them down. Okay, oxygen toxicity is very real, and you want their oxygen down to whatever lowest level keeps them saturated as possible. So that's the other kind of emphasis, is not only low volumes, crank down the oxygen as soon as you can, but keep them oxygenated. Any questions? It's kind of cool, actually. It's really put, it's kind of, I don't know, sepsis patients used to be, oh, here we go again, and now it's like, oh, all right, did we get the pressure up? Are they peeing? You know, what vent settings did you pick? Why? Did you give steroids? You know, it's, it's actually more fun than it used to be, I think. Yeah. Very good question. I think the reality is you should probably pull any line that is pullable without a detriment to the patient. So things like pick lines, usually you can get another line in somewhere else. The harder issues are people who come up with things like Quintins for dialysis. They need dialysis. And that, I, that, that's one of those lots of phone calls. Hello, Dr. Kidney. You know, hello, Dr. ID. And everybody talks to each other about whether that should be pulled or not. Yeah. Uh-huh. Did, did Al talk about Atomidate at all? Do you guys know the Atomidate issue right now? Atomidate is an adrenal suppressive. It hits the 21 hydroxylase enzyme. It is an adrenal suppressant, and it absolutely, flat out, without question, is an adrenal suppressant. Um, Al was just telling me there's a paper that just came out in a peds population of over 50 kids, like 58 or 60 kids with meningococcemia. So this is a very select, critically ill peds group. They found a double mortality rate if those kids were intubated using Atomidate versus using a different induction agent. That parallels an adult study that had about 24 patients in it that also found a similar finding, double mortality by getting Atomidate. And the theory is you're septic, you already have adrenal issues, you had a second whammy by giving this um, Atomidate, you now block an enzyme that gives you any chance of making your own cortisol for 24 hours, and it increases the risk of mortality. I think the safest approach, and, nobody, and by the way, the other thing nobody knows is if you still give that person steroids, because you were going to anyway, you know, I've, I know the cutting edge stuff, I'm going to give the steroids, does that then negate that Atomidate issue? Nobody knows that. So the, what is probably the most prudent approach is if you think you're going to intubate a septic person to use a different induction agent than Atomidate. By the way, the Atomidate thing initially it was felt to be only with infusions that people got that adrenal suppression. It's now crystal clear a single dose can do it. Absolutely clear. A single dose can cause adrenal suppression. So, so I think the safest thing to do is use a different induction agent in a septic person you're intubating if Atomidate's your usual drug. Let's use something else. Good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when does that start to happen? You know, they, it looks like it starts to happen early, um, which is one of the reasons that the push to decrease oxygen in the ER is being kind of pushed through. It looks like it happens from the get-go, uh, that they're already, the, the lung is already sort of in flux, so there are, it's already risk for ARDS, the leak is already occurring, and it looks like it's early. So the, and it actually kind of makes sense. If we can follow a pulse ox, it's not that hard to dial down the oxygen and keep them at a SAT of 97-ish percent, or even lower, depending on the patient. But, but it, oxygen toxicity is a pretty early thing. And the other problem with it they found is that once somebody's stuck on 100%, they get taken upstairs, and it's now 24 hours, and they've finally been transferred to the bed, and it doesn't really get addressed until way down the line. So that's, they're pushing now, focusing us on the issue so that it gets dialed down early, rather than transfer time, move time, up in the unit, next nursing shift, et cetera. Yeah. 
It's totally up to you. The, our choices of um, agents is pretty broad. I would probably avoid propofol only in that it tends to cause hemodynamic abnormality, particularly low blood pressure. Although Versed doesn't do it as much. At, Versed's bigger issue is respiratory depression, which I don't care about if I'm going to intubate. So in that case, the, I'll tell you the issue you run into with that is if you really want to be the good ER doc, you know that the, you know, in, the induction dose of Versed is huge. Okay, it's 20 milligrams in a normal adult. It's 0.7 per kilo. What you can do is futz. Okay, I'm worried about this blood pressure issue. I'm going to go down on that dose. I'm going to give them 0.3 or I'm going to give them 0.2 knowing I'm not inducing unconsciousness necessarily, but I've taken enough of the edge off without Rob and Peter to pay Paul to get them down. You can. No, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely, and you can actually still use ketamine. Ketamine is something that probably has a niche in this area, but it hasn't been studied. And the thing is, you know, you gotta be, I think the, I'll tell you the issue that would come up with that is the septic older person with heart disease that you gave ketamine to to get them induced to intubate, who then goes on to have EMI. I understand, no, I totally, I'm in your ballpark here, but as a plaintiff's attorney, I could say, excuse me, Dr. So-and-so, you know, don't you know ketamine can cause, you know, problems with catecholamine release and blah, 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 and so just understanding what you're doing is totally fine as long as you understand what you're doing, that there is and the risk of MI, we've all seen gazillions of these. The septic patient who comes in who has some heart disease and they go on to have an MI, you know, demand MI or a real one 24 hours later. So it's kind of up to you to decide which agent you use, but we have plenty to choose from. It's just going to take some tweaking. Atomidate's just so nice and easy and clean and fabulous. And, yeah? Has anyone else seen a community-acquired MRSA pneumonias? They, they die very quickly. Quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually interesting. We didn't see any until about five months ago, and we've had a flurry of these. Um, MRSA, we'll talk about MRSA tomorrow in detail, but MRSA, we were all kind of joking about when this community-acquired MRSA got really bad. You know, ah, oh, an abscess, so big deal. It's like, it's here. <laughs> it's now causing parenchymal disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we have just seen them in the last couple of months, yep. and two in a couple of days. Right, and they crash and, and burn. Mm -mm. No, it, because it's evolving too quickly. I talked to our, IDs, our, our ID guys are freaked out about this because we've had oh, probably a half a dozen cases now. Have and it's a, lived? no, nobody lives. And it's all, all been relatively young people. We had a 12-year-old, a couple 20-year-olds. It's all been, they come in and they just crash. Yeah, it's bad. It's bad. 